Much of my landscape photography is commercial. This shot would never get far in a competition, but it was good enough for a calendar front cover. In approach, there is an enormous difference between commercial and artistic photography. This is not to suggest that commercial work is not creative. I am talking about photographs that are absolute and artistic for their own sake, and not restricted by the trappings of commerce or the requirements of a brief. I will state the technical information, but don't be fooled into thinking that only this information will improve your photography. It won't. They are the nuts and bolts, the rudiments of photography working in the background that open up and allow the creative process to flourish when confronted by a great scene. I will also reveal that private world between my ears when assessing the photographic merits of a view. For my first image, technique was certainly important. And before you ask, what filter did I use? I didn't. It is quite an early image, pre four thirds. The E20 with a fixed lens was a forerunner of the classic E1 released in 2003. One of those traditional techniques not swamped by automation is to position the sun partially behind a rock. Provided the aperture is not too large, you can achieve a starburst. No special filter or camera control required, just experience born out of discovery and sometimes by mistake. Staying at a nearby hotel, I rose in time to catch the early morning mist. Taken in 2004, I hadn't at this stage refined my digital technique. Now I spot meter for greater control and underexposed by a third of a stop. I know this is frowned upon. I do it because it works. Important is the positioning of the rock. It adds depth and breaks up an unappealing foreground. Because the sensor in the E20 is small, sharpness from front to back is easy, even at f4. The mist didn't last long, by the way. My next camera was the E1, which I still have. It heralded a marked improvement in quality, its hallmark feature being a protected sensor that didn't get contaminated by dust when exposed to the elements when changing lenses. Shooting into the light adds drama, creating silhouettes. We can see a view into the light better than any camera. Without control, it could overexpose highlights and underexpose shadows, all in the same image. Metering highlights, allowing underexposure in dark areas, will create a silhouette, which of course the eye does not see. It is a photographic effect. In this second shot of Loch Moidart, silhouettes emphasize the shoreline patterns. I underexposed by two thirds of a stop and used center weighted metering to make sure that the sandbank was underexposed, heightening the silhouette effect and preventing highlights from overexposure. A small aperture was used to stop flare when using a zoom lens, which could end up worse than diffraction. In addition to the big view, I like to get down on my hands and knees and look for a closer view, more difficult these days under the weight of a bus pass. It was taken a long time ago and I am not quite sure why I underexposed by a whole stop, possibly to darken the sky as the foreground sand would need less exposure. Rainbows require a skill outside photography. You need to understand weather. 
Loch Eilot in Moidart on the west coast of Scotland is a rainbow hotspot. I used the location in my Loch Arbor photography tours, and we were often lucky. Because it faces the Atlantic with mountains not far away, an unstable airstream off the sea late in the day often produced the prize. Come back another day, and the view can look amazingly different, but expect to suffer for your art by getting soaking wet. I have to admit, we did have a coach. An essential skill for any photographer is to see a picture that most people would walk by. Whilst most of us are attracted by the big view, stop and look at what is beneath your feet. Turner visited Margate on several occasions, possibly for social purposes rather than artistic, but an arts centre has been erected in his name. I arrived at sunset, and the late afternoon light on the harbour was magic, but no doubt much has changed since Turner's time, such as these steps. During the day, these steps would not attract much attention, but at sunset, shortly after a high tide, it's a different story. Because of high contrast, spot metering is essential, followed by some post-production correction. I prefer the near view without a background, but I took several shots. The view is Wetherlam from Sergeant Man, which I climbed from Grasmere. Not too much sky. It isn't very interesting. Now this concentrates our gaze on the summits and ridges going across the photograph. I took the much lighter 12 to 50 lens, which was the original kit lens for the very first EM5. Having already walked a considerable number of miles over rough ground with much climbing, I can still comfortably hand hold the camera at a five hundredth of a second with the image stabilizer, even if I am still trying to catch my breath. Parallel lines are again a feature, and of course, this shot is completely at the mercy of weather. It was taken from the grounds of the Craflin estate, where H.F. Holidays used to have a hotel. When staying overnight at a beautiful location, you have more flexibility to wait for that magic moment. On holiday, by all means, visit the local pub for dinner. But plan your visit carefully, and don't stay too long, otherwise you might miss the evening light but watch the weather forecast before leaving your hotel. The foreground is a jumble, quite frankly, but you want some interest in that area. A reflection in the river might have helped. Spot metering with an electronic finder is essential to maintain colour. The image has a predominance of shadow, therefore Matrix metering will overexpose the image. I pick a highlight as the reference exposure. Half depress the shutter button on S-AF to lock. Recompose and take picture. I find myself using this technique for practically everything because it offers greater control. I do save to raw in case I muck things up. I walk long distances for my shots, sometimes as much as 16 miles. Wandering lonely as a cloud, I can stop and survey the scene to my heart's content. I don't drive anymore. I catch a train instead, and probably fall asleep, which is fine so long as I don't end up at London, Victoria or Brighton. This isolated dead tree made an effective complement to that threatening sky. 
It rained, but my search for a rainbow where the sun made a brief appearance was in vain. But it did illuminate the cathedral, and that was a nice touch of magic to complete the day. And when I got back to the station, the buffet was still open. Driving home on the A29 isn't much fun, because it has hardly been upgraded since the Romans came this way, so train was quicker. I don't weigh myself down with unnecessary gear on a chute. Through research and knowledge, I know what to take, and more importantly, what to leave behind. Although I have used a variety of gear for this program, it does condense nearly 20 years. Today, my working kit is the Olympus EM1 Mark II and the 12-100 Pro lens, with the EM10 Mark II, with the 14-42 Pancake lens as backup. I don't find extreme telephoto or wide-angle optics suitable for landscapes, but I experiment with them on other subjects. I often travel by train and bus, so I don't carry my camera in a bag that advertises its contents. Instead, I resort to a grubby rucksack that you would disown. This keeps it safe in busy public places. On a shoot, I remain incognito. You wouldn't know that I was a photographer, giving me space, peace and freedom essential for my work.